Let me remind you that we are in our series on the book of Daniel. This series is entitled, Living a Faithful Life in the Midst of Turbulent Times. I've entitled this message today, Taming Lions 101. Now, particularly in college-level courses, that 101 is the most elementary. You begin there, and then you build up. You can have 200-level, uh, 300-level courses, 400-level, which is usually a, a senior level there. But the very elementary level is 101. Taming lions. What's the thing? What's the basic things I need to know about taming lions? Now, we've been talking about Daniel and the lion's den, but in this chapter here, this is where he's actually thrown into the lion's den. And he gets devoured, beaten up by the lions, right? Well, no, he doesn't, okay? But we'll look at why he didn't and how we can take this story so many years ago and apply it to our own lives. Now, the story of Daniel in the lion's den is one of the best loved, one of the best known Bible stories in all of God's Word. Little children have grown up knowing this story and loving this story and remembering this story for years on end. Sunday school teachers have taught the basics about this, core, this story and what it really means. In days of slavery, this story became the basis of so many Negro spirituals. And it has encouraged the people of God over and over and over again in the past and in so many years to come. This is a story filled with so many unexpected twists. You wouldn't expect that to be thrown into the lion's den and had happened what happened to Daniel. That was an unexpected twist. We see the good guy comes out the winner and the bad guys are the losers. And they're the ones that get eaten up and devoured. But along the way, in studying the entire sixth chapter, we see the secret to Daniel's success. Somehow, somehow through it all, he managed to survive and he managed to, to thrive in the midst of a spiritually hostile environment. Now, maybe now is a good time to make this point. We as Christians live in a world of spiritual hostility. There's a lot of spiritual hostility. Would you believe that? I mean, do you believe that? Is there some kind of affirmation to shake your heads if you believe that? I see some of you. Well, even if you don't know, I'm here to tell you. And there is a hostility toward spirituality today. And there is the temptation from the world for us to compromise what we stand on, to compromise our principles, to compromise our faith and our belief and our convictions. That's exactly what was going on with Daniel. See, the world, the world doesn't want its conscience pierced. And the world doesn't reward those who dare to stand up for what they believe. The world doesn't go around rewarding those kind of people. Now, the book of Daniel tells us how to live for God in such a hostile environment. Daniel's example to us reminds us of so many things. It reminds us that it can be done. We can live, and we can live abundantly. We can live in line with God's will. But it doesn't mean it's going to come easy. There's going to be some discomfort. There's going to be some ridicule. God doesn't promise it's going to be an easy road. He also reminds us through this story here that there is a spiritual battle raging all around us. That was true 2,500 years ago with Daniel. It's true right now in our day and time. And we're also reminded that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And his goal is to devour every one of us. You see, the devil has an army of supporters 
whose major call, their major role in life is to harass us, is to trick us up, to trap us. That's what he wants to do. And I've always believed that you can tell a lot about a person by the quality of their enemies. By the quality of their enemies. The people who hated Daniel were not friends of God. They were not godly people. They were not seeking to know and do God's will. They came to attack Daniel. But they could find no fault in this man. They could find no corruption. And then they really had no answer for what he believed and how God delivered him and how God was at work. Before we go any further, let me remind you of a few things. First of all, you know, when we got into the book of Daniel, Daniel was a teenager. And now he's an older man. He's some 80 to 85 years old when we get here at this point in time. An 80, 85-year-old man thrown into a lion's den. So you need to know that there's been a lot of things that have transpired over the years. He is now serving under a new king. Remember King Nebi that we talked about? Nebuchadnezzar? He's gone. He's out of the picture now. It's now King Darius. And I'm going to try to get this. I know where it is. It's just a matter of getting to the right people and doing it. I've got a picture of the grave of Daniel and Darius when I was in Persia several years ago. And I want to be able to show that to you. But Darius is now the king. He's ruling over this new kingdom there in the Medo-Persian Empire. As the chapter opens, we see that Daniel, once again, is about to be promoted to a high office. Now, Darius realized that this is a man of integrity. And he wants to move him up from the third ranking highest official to the second ranking highest official. Now, now that's a pretty good honor when you think about it. He's not a native of this country at all. This is a new foreign land to him. But he has been there the biggest part of his life now, ever since he was a teenager, held in captivity. But then we see where the intrigue begins. The administration and the satraps. You know what satraps are? Probably not something that you talk about every day. Carolyn, I would, I would say, I meant to talk to you earlier about this. I would, I would compare the satraps to, to the province here as a lot like our state representatives here in, 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 the, in the state that, that answer to the governor. So we see the high-ranking officials that they are. And Scripture tells us, and we'll see this here in just a moment, that the administration and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his contact in government affairs. But it wasn't there. They couldn't find those charges because he didn't do anything. He was a man of integrity. There was no corruption. And he was trustworthy. Let's read Daniel, the sixth chapter, starting with verses 4 and going through 5. At this time, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But they couldn't do it. It wasn't there. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, Okay, we're not going to find anything on basis of charges against this man, Daniel, unless, unless it has something to do with the law of God. Now we might be able to trump up something there. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, Oh, King Darius, live forever. Now, this is what his enemies discovered as they examined his life. He was faithful in his duties. He was flawless in his character. And he was fervent in his prayer life. Those are the three marks of, of godliness that even the unbelievers saw. 
stood out in his life. And whether they liked him or not, those are the characteristics that represented who Daniel really was. Let me back down and slow down just a little. Do you realize there's people that watch you? There's non-believers out there in the workforce and in the community that watch you. They watch what you say. They see what you do. They listen to your words. You know, those are the kinds of people they know just how hard of a worker you really are. Or they know how you slack off when you can. They know what kind of character you have. Or maybe the character that you don't have. And if they watch you long enough and closely enough, they'll know something about your prayer life. About who you are. You know, in your relationship to the Lord. Whatever is in your heart will sooner or later come out. It'll be revealed. And they saw the things that were in Daniel's heart. Those were the things that were being revealed. And even people who do not know the Lord will be able to see those things. And they will know who you truly are. Now, in Daniel's case, even his enemies had to admit that he had no glaring weaknesses. Of all people, you'd think the enemies would be able to come up with something. But there was no glaring weakness anywhere in his life whatsoever. So let's just think about this for a moment. I'm not sure that anything better could be said about any individual than for their enemies to admit that we can find nothing wrong with this man. Sort of like Billy Graham, you know. I was watching him last night. You know, all of his years, the critics have tried to get something on him, but it wasn't there. He was a godly man. He was a man of integrity and still is, even though he's 95, soon be 96 in November. But if it's not there, they may make it up, but they certainly can't substantiate it. And that's the case with Daniel. I like what Harry Truman said many years ago. Fame is a vapor. It's here, it's gone. Popularity is an accident. Riches take wings. Those who cheer you today may be cursing you tomorrow. Only one thing endures, and that's character. And we can take a lot of things away from a lot of people, but you cannot take a person's character away from them. Only they can do that. Okay, Daniel is hated. Why? He's very successful. Boy, he's climbed up the ranks there. Others, I'm sure, were envious of that. He was hated because he was such a godly man. And you could see God's hand upon his life. And certainly those ungodly people didn't really like what they saw. I believe that God wants to teach us that even though we do all the right things and we can be people of integrity, we can be people that are trustworthy and honorable, but that does not mean that everything is going to always go right. That was certainly true with Daniel. He did all the right things and he still got thrown into the lion's den. Now, now let's just suppose... That, that, that your enemies decide to check you out. The same way that the satraps tried to check out Daniel. Suppose they hired a PI, a private investigator, Magnum or somebody. Suppose they hired him or hired him or her to check out every aspect of your life, your public life your private life, the past, the present, what would they be able to uncover? I mean, certainly they, they would check out how you treat your children or other children, how you treat your spouse. They might even want to check your video rentals, see what kind of videos you're renting. And they would scrutinize any and all of your business deals. What about your vocabulary at home? 
Because, see, for some people, their vocabulary at home may be different than what it is out there in the marketplace or at church or at work. What about the places that you choose to visit? Now, could any one of us survive that kind of scrutiny? Daniel did. Daniel was a godly man. But what made him godly? Did God just handpick him and said, you're going to be godly? Well, we'll, we'll look at that. If you listen real closely, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see here. Those satraps tried real hard to bring them down. But they didn't. And they couldn't. Not because of anything that he did anyway. But I do have to tell you one thing I've noticed in reading this chapter about four times. He did have one flaw. He did have one flaw. And that was that he was utterly predictable. His enemies knew that he's going to do this. And he did it every day. He was utterly predictable in his prayer life. They knew that three times every day he was going to pray. He prayed at the same time. He prayed in the same way so that his enemies realized what they could do. And it was from that angle that his enemies, the satraps, were going to attack him. I'm sure you've heard this. A book is written by this title. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, think about that. If there's going to be a conviction, there's got to be the evidence there, okay? Now, you can go around talking about being a Christian, going to church, going through the motions and all that. But when it comes to your day in court, there's got to be the evidence there. Would there be enough evidence in our lives to convict us for being a Christian? We can talk about it. But is the evidence there? See, when they arrested Daniel for being a man of prayer, the evidence was there. That was the evidence that had him thrown into the lion's den. So, here's the conniving events of the satraps. They asked King Daniel to pass a 30-day law forbidding anyone to pray to anybody except the king. So, hey, let's be king for a month. All the prayers have to be directed to you, oh Darius. That sounded pretty good. All the prayers are prayed to me. Why not? There are some people thriving for that kind of, uh, of attention. So what happened? You read the rest of the chap chapter and you'll see that Darius signed the law. Knowing that once it was signed and published, it could not be repealed. Now he had no idea. And Darius' benefit, I've got to say, he had no idea that Daniel was the one intended to be entrapped through this law. It turns out that Daniel was a victim of his own integrity, ironically enough. So, what do you do? What do you do when you discover that your enemies have passed a law aimed at one person and you are that one person. What do you do? He found himself caught in a trap. It's like walking around with a, a target on the back of your shirt. Pretty uncomfortable position to be in. Now let's look at verse 10 of the same chapter. And here we see the secret to his greatness. All right. Now then, Darius learned that the decree had been published. He went home to his upstairs room. I've got a picture of this. He went to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. And we've talked about why those windows were open, why he prayed to Jerusalem. Three times a day, or did he do? He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. 
Now, I try to look at certain passages. Is there something in that, that one verse right there that really stands out? If I had the highlights, what would it be? For me, it would be those last few words, just as he had done before. It wasn't something new. It wasn't something he just started. That had been his routine for life. Three times a day, he got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God. And I'm giving him the benefit of a doubt. He's 80, 85 years old, okay? I would say for the past 70 years at least, he's been praying. We know as a teenager, he was a praying person. So 70 years of age, praying three times a day. He would get up in the morning and pray. In the middle of the day, he would pray. Late in the evening, he would pray. It was like clockwork. And even his enemies knew that it was predictable. They knew what he was going to do. If he went on a business trip to another province, stopped what he was doing and prayed. If he went on vacation, took his chariot and family and went on vacation somewhere, he stopped and prayed. If he was going through his everyday activities, he stopped three times a day and prayed. Well, let me just interrupt myself here. I may drive down the road and be praying. I may be walking down the hallway praying. I may be riding my bicycle praying. Um, but you know, that's still not the same. I can't do those things and be totally focused in my prayer life on God. I'm praying, but I'm watching traffic. I'm praying, and then I get diverted because somebody pulls out in front of me. No, I'm not totally focused. But what I see Daniel doing right here is he is focused. He stops what he's doing and prays and does that every day, three times a day. And I did the math. Well, I'll admit I did get my calculator out, okay, just for accuracy. But if he prayed three times a day for 70 years, then that means there are 76,650 prayers that he prayed to God. That's a lot of prayers, isn't it? And stopping what he was doing and praying. But there's no wonder that Scripture says that he went to his room and opened up his window and prayed toward Jerusalem. It's no wonder he did that because after 70 years, it's, it's a hard habit to break. He's done it for so long. Do you know it didn't really matter to him? Those little snotty nose safe traps trying to trap him. He really didn't care. It really didn't matter. But they had tricked Darius into signing that 30-day law. But praying was a part of Daniel's routine. So it was no big deal. He wasn't going to let some law that he believed in and a God that he worshipped change him from doing what he was doing. I just wonder, you know, between our services here, between the 9 o'clock service and then those that we may have back in the back, and, you know, on any given Sunday now, we'll have 15, 17 people in the nursery. Thank God. Um, but, and I realize that some of those may be too young to really know the benefits of prayer, uh, but particularly the little kids. And, but, but I'm counting them. And then what about those out there in the social media that we have that will hear this on television? What about if every one of us prayed? I'm using the number 200, which I think is a very low figure. But say there's 200 of us, and we prayed three times a day, every day. You think God's going to hear those prayers? Going to keep them busy? I mean, he's got a lot of other more important people to listen to than us. You think he's going to hear those prayers? Certainly he's going to hear those prayers. But if 200 of us prayed three times a day for an entire year, that would be 219,000 prayers. I just wonder how our lives would be different if we did that. How much closer would our lives be in line with Daniel and his strength and his convictions 
if we did the same thing. Now, you've got to remember who Daniel is, okay? Daniel is one of the top three highest ranking officials in the Medo-Persian Empire. He's got a plate full of responsibilities. No, he doesn't have time to stop what he's doing three times a day and pray. But he made time. And Daniel was also the kind of person that saw prayer as being so important to him that he was willing to die rather than to give up his right to pray every day. Oh, come on, folks. If we just stop praying, then the world will stop laughing at us. If we just stop going through the motions of being in church and doing this, then, then, then the world will stop making fun of us and call us holier than thou people. We're not holier than thou. I don't see myself as ever being a holier than thou. I just see myself standing in the need of prayer. And I know the need of doing that. I think all of us would agree that the great marks of true faith is a committed prayer life. How was he so strong in his faith? Because he prayed to God every day, three times a day, and he was focused on prayer, not anything and everything else going on around him. He grew in his faith. You see, he was thrown into that lion's den. Do you know what I believe was really his lion's den? His bedroom. It was his bedroom. It was right there that he took on the battles of his own life. It was there that the battles in his own life were fought. He won or lost. So that prayer room was really, or that bedroom was really his, uh, his lion's den. We think that the real miracle was that he was delivered from the mouth of the lion in the lion's den. But I really believe the real miracle is that he continued to pray even when he realized his life was on the line. Okay, got to finish up real quickly here. Darius realized that he'd been tricked. The king realized he'd been. He loved Daniel. He saw Daniel as being a man of integrity. And immediately he begins to try to find loopholes to get him out of had to be thrown into the lion's den. But there weren't any loopholes. It already signed the decree. It was signed in, into law. And, and if he backed out on that, then they would make him look weak and ineffective as the king. Now, you need to remember that the lion's den was a very crude and very effective means of capital punishment in that day and time. Nobody survived getting thrown into the lion's den. Those lions were hungry. They loved flesh and blood. Loved gnawing on human bones. Nobody survived. Except Daniel. But they knew that Daniel was just as good as dead. Throw him in there, buddy. We got rid of him. He's gone. But the rest of the story tells us different. See, he did not try to escape the consequences of praying to God. I'm going to be honest with you, folks. Somebody tells me they're going to throw me into a a den of skunks. I'm probably going to back away. And skunks wouldn't be nearly as deadly as lions. Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I won't pray, okay? I'd be tempted to do that. I'd be tempted to make a deal with God. Okay, God, I don't want to get thrown in that lion's den. Whatever you want me to do, okay, Lord, I'll do it. Try to make a deal. Try to bargain with them. See, there's so much encouragement. There's so much more to be said about all this. My goodness. But there's so much encouragement that we get from Daniel that can help us in our own daily life when we find ourselves in the lion's den. And some of you are there. Some of you have certainly been there, and some of you may be there in the future. What am I going to do? There's no way out of this. Those lions are hungry. They're going to eat me alive. But we see what Daniel did. 
See, serving the Lord is not going to be an easy road. Most of us that are committed in that relationship know that. But the Lord says, be of good cheer. You put your faith and your trust in me. You lean solely upon me. I'll take care of you. See, that doesn't happen just when we get thrown into line. This happened because he spent so many years praying, developing an in-depth, meaningful relationship with the Lord. It wasn't something that just happened all of a sudden. But he was equipped for what was to happen. My blessing for each of you is this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We're looking this morning at the fourth chapter of Daniel. And I've entitled this message, That Crazy King. Was he on something? When you read the fourth chapter of Daniel and you see what he did, and we just touched.